Um, so this is um, joint work with um, Pierre Paul Beninio at the University of Bern and uh, Linda Schilling at Ecole Polytechnique uh, in Quest. Um, I guess Linda Schilling was originally scheduled to give this talk, and then in the last minute, uh, you know, or, or fairly recently, you know, we, uh, you know, um, you know, we, we, we talked about it and uh, figured that maybe uh, um, I, I could give the talk. So here I am. So thanks for having us in the program and having this paper. So this is going to be an entirely theoretical paper. And um, it's about, um, you know, thinking about what these cryptocurrencies might do to the international monetary arrangement that we've seen, how much, uh, how much they will do to, um, you know, uh, official currencies, such as central bank uh, currencies, right, that whether they're digital or not is, is sort of less of an issue. Okay, so, um, and the motivation for that is that we're seeing these cryptocurrencies on the rise. I mean, Bitcoin is a granddaddy, now they are many more i don't know how many how many there are maybe a few thousands for sure and um and many of them are small they gather the attention of some regulators but recently there have been some entries that are big and are potential game changers and so it's, as a result uh, regulators and monetary authorities have really paid attention one is uh, facebook's libra that's probably the most well known but it's hard to imagine that that's going to be the last uh, and as you know, the original uh, concept was that it was backed by a pool of low-risk assets and currencies that it could be, you know, it, it, you know, circulated by building on on Facebook, and then would, that it could be used worldwide. Now it's it's constantly changing, so I don't want to sort of talk about all the all the twists and turns of the Libra. Uh, issue, but you know, um, it, it certainly says that uh, Libra is a game changer, and central bankers, uh, you know, may not like it, but they have to do something about it. And exactly what you know is a question. So this paper is meant to help understand uh, you know what that competition does. Now, uh, this paper, you know, is a theoretical exercise, and it and it thinks about currencies, including digital currencies, as money. And if you open a textbook on monetary theory, then you know, teach money, you know, then there, then there are always three functions that get emphasized. One is the medium of exchange, one is store value, and one is the unit of account. So this paper is really all about the medium of exchange. You know, how much do you use that currency for making payments, you know, the, the liquidity service that it provides? So that's uh, that's that that has center stage here, and what happens if that's taken over by cryptocurrencies to some degree? What we argue is that global currencies change the landscape. Uh, with only national currencies, they're not medium of exchange in a foreign country. You know, at least not for the for the well developed countries in a meaningful extent. I mean, the dollar is not circulating much in Europe, and vice versa. And the exchange rates might fluctuate, but with a global currency, we get a global medium of exchange. It's the same uh, currency, the same global, the Libra, you know, the Bitcoin is Bitcoin, whether it's Japan or Europe or the United States. So across these countries, the exchange rate is, is unity, you know, it, you know, at, at least, uh, you know, from a, from a macro perspective, I mean, there are little wiggles, but let's not concern ourselves with that. Uh, and, and so these global currencies compete locally with national currencies, and that induces a transnational uh, currency competition through this global currency. And with that, what we are getting is a, you know, what we call, you know, a new Im impossibility, right? There was this old impossible trinity due to Mundell and Fleming that with free capital flows, you can't both have independent monetary policy and the exchange rates. We maintain the free capital flows assumption here, but we also introduce above and beyond Mundell and Fleming, a global currency circulating alongside national currencies. And if, if it's used, if it's used alongside these national currencies, then the monetary policy interest rates are equalized and exchange rates are risk-adjusted martingales. Risk-adjusted martingales means that, uh, you know, if there was no uncertainty, there would have to be constant. So that's, a, that's an extreme version of a pegged exchange rate, if you like. And, and the pol monetary policy interest rates are equalized, so they're no longer, they're longer long independent. So it's a, it's a strengthened version, if you like, of the impossible trinity. We call this crypto-enforced monetary policy synchronization, or SEMS. There are escape options, but we argue they're unpleasant, and additional restrictions arise in, in case of global currencies asset-backed, as would be the case uh, with, with Libra. So there's a literature here. Let me, in the interest of time, let me let me skip that, and let me head right into the model. So there's um, 
discrete time. So time marches forward, zero, one, two. There are two countries and there are three currencies. So there's home, there's foreign, there's global. You know, people sometimes ask, couldn't this be gold? Could, you know, some other things. But, you know, you don't see people using gold much for, for payments, right? Remember, this is all about the medium of exchange here. Whereas that's the game changer. Cryptocurrencies really can become, uh, you know, be used as a, as a medium of exchange, as, as, a, as, a mean, as a means of payment, right? I mean, that's really that's really the issue here. So an example would be, think of H as a dollar, F as a yen, and G as a Libra. You know, I chose yen here as a foreign country, as a foreign currency, since I guess most of the participants in this conference can think of yen as a foreign currency. So, but if you're in Europe, then maybe H is euro for you rather than the dollar. Okay. So then there's a, you know, the capital markets, that's that's uh, modeled by nominal stochastic discount factor in each country. And we have the central bank setting normal interest rates for national currencies and money offer liquidity services. So that's the sense in which, you know, we look at the money as medium of exchange function here. Now the model is very stripped down, right? You could write down, I don't know, the whole the whole protocol of how trades happen and, and what happens with prices and you know all the rest of the uh, rest of the structure of the economy, but the purpose of the paper was really to 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 encompass many many papers out there in the literature and, and indeed in the paper we go into some of them and show how they how the how they all have have the key ingredients that we need here so they can all be as for the purpose of of this analysis can be all distilled down to these few ingredients. And and so it's a it's a it's a it's a minimalistic paper. It's a it's a it's a bare bones strip tease paper, if you like. But we only assume what we absolutely need. And and if you want to build a whole model around it, I mean be my guess, but it's not necessary. Okay. So we're having these stochastic discount factors here. And stochastic discount factors mean that if you have a return, you know, that's say denominated in dollars, or you know, you invest a dollar, how many dollars do you get tomorrow? Um, that so that's dominated in the, in the home currency. I mean, you might also have returns that, that are denominated in yen, for example. You know, these returns have to satisfy these uh, these asset pricing equations, Lucas, Rubens, and Breeden asset, asset pricing equation. That one has to be the expectation of these returns risk adjusted by these stochastic discount factors. And the same is true, you know, if you if you if you take a if you take a yen return, you have to discount it at this uh, with this uh, yen denominated stochastic discount factor. So as an example, you can think of the normal interest rates, and this is all that we have here about central banks, really. You know, you can figure out what's the normal interest rate. Then, well, in, if you have a normal interest rate it, that means the re normal return is one plus it. So these equations above immediately give you the equations on the bottom. Where one plus one over one plus it is just expectation of the stochastic discount factor in either country. Now we have to introduce exchange rates, right? And that's always something where my head starts spinning. But you know, you just keep track of it, and then it's uh, not that hard. So we have st, which is price of one foreign currency in terms of the home currency. So how many dollars do you have to spend per yen? Uh, you can talk about the inverse, then it's how many yen you spend per dollars. And there are also exchange rates of the global currencies in terms of the home and foreign currencies. We call them prices, right? People typically refer to the Bitcoin price, but you could also refer to it as, as Bitcoin exchange rate. So that's what we denote by QT. QT is the price of one global currency in terms of age, how many dollars you spend per libra, how many yen you spend per libra. All right, and here is now our complete markets assumption, right? Remember that we said we have these free capital markets as, as in um, Mandel Fleming. And this is the extent of which we have this. We're saying state by state, no matter what, what state is realized tomorrow, the, the, the people using the yen stochastic discount factor and the dollar denominated stochastic discount factor agree on how to value that. So these stochastic discount factors agree state by state. The only thing that you have to do is convert it by the appropriate exchange rate. So you have to convert you know, something that's yen tomorrow and yen today into something that's dollar tomorrow and dollar today. But you know, other than that, it's, it's you, know, you sign the sign prices to the state. So that's the, that's a complete market's assumption here. As a result, one can get these equations that are that are well known in the carry trade literature. Um, that is, you can also price, you know, the 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 um, the dollar bond, the IT, just using the, you know, the yen denominated stochastic discount factor, simply by also including this exchange rate term. There's some economics behind it that I you know, that is sort of 
down at the bottom of the slide, but let me not dwell on that. It's all about these carry trades in some sense. All right. So, and one implication that comes out of this is that exchange rates must be um, interest, you know, that they, you know, interest adjust martingales, if you like. So, the expected future exchange rate, the expected future exchange rate is the current exchange rate times a term that is, that denotes differences essentially, or the 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 the, the, the or it's, it's here it's a ratio, but in first order approximation of difference in the in the interest rates between uh, the United States and, and Japan in this case. Now there's a tilde here on this expectation, which just means that you have to you know you have to adjust for the risk, so you have to do this risk adjusting. Of the expectation, but this but this risk adjusted uh, expectation of the exchange rate is the current exchange rate times its interest term. Okay, and that's stochastic uncovered interest parity. With that, let me introduce a final element, which are the liquidity services, because money is a medium of exchange. So we imagine that if you use one unit of the home currency, then that it provides LT units of liquidity services. If you use G at home, it also provides liquidity services in proportion to its value in terms of dollars. So it's going to divide, it's going to provide LT times QT units of liquidity services. You know, having a dollar in your pocket is nice because you can go and you can shop. You know, you can't do that with a bond. And that's exactly what these liquidity services are. Here we're assuming that the home and the global currency are perfect substitutes as far as these transactions are concerned. In the appendix in the paper, we go into you know questions: What happens if that's not exactly the case? And that would that could enrich the model considerably. Here we just wanted to get a very stark, very clean result, and that's why we have this perfect substitution. Same thing in um, same thing abroad, right? Now you you always see that if is used, right? I mean, you may not use this currency, right? You know, it may be it may be that you don't want to use it, that you just want to hold on to it, right? And when would you do this? Well, you know, look at this equation here, for example, right? What you're getting is always these equations, right? That, uh, um, you know, I mean, think about this equation maybe first, right? The return on the dollar is just one dollar, right? And, and so, you know, certainly something that has a positive normal interest rate dominates the dollar in return. So the dollar is a bad store of value. And the only reason that people hang on to the dollar and have a dollar in their pocket is because they're also getting these liquidity services LT. Same would have to be true for the for the cryptocurrencies, right? And here's sort of the same equation. The next equation is the same equation for the for the QT now. But you might not want to spend it, right? The right hand side is what you get if you actually go ahead and spend the cryptocurrency. You get the liquidity services LT, and you then also get the discounted future value of the cryptocurrency. But that may not be, you know, that may be less than what you paid for it, right? And so maybe. Maybe you really want to use it in a foreign country or for some other purposes and you're not ready to spend it. So that's why the inequalities go this way. This took us a lot of thought that the inequalities really have to go this way rather than the other way around. And, and that sort of, uh, you know, could talk at length about that, but that's sort of the key part of this paper. Now, if, they, if you get equality, interpret this as saying that you, that you may use it at home. I mean, there could be the knife edge case where it's not used nonetheless uh, equal. But uh, but we are, we are slightly sloppy in the language. You say equality means it's used at home. Bigger than means it's not used. So that's the that's what we mean by used and not used. If it's if it's used, it definitely has to be equal. If it's equal, you know, you might be in the in the borderline case where actually you know very small quantities are only used. So that's a possibility certainly. All right. So lots of examples. Here's now our main result. Suppose the national currencies are used in the countries. You know, that, that seems natural, right? So the dollar is used for transactions in, in the United States. The yen is used for transactions in Japan. Suppose the global currency is valued. They're always equilibrium, often in these, you know, kinds of models where, you know, particular currencies that have no intrinsic value are valued at zero. You know, they're always there. That's not, you know, true, but, you know, they're not of... Uh, you know that those are not particularly interesting for our analysis here. I'm not, we don't want to rule them out, but that's why we make this assumption. Suppose it's valued, and suppose now that the global currency is used in both countries. Now remember, we don't have a full-blown model here, so we can't. I can't tell you the circumstances under which it might be used or not be used. Right? That's outside. You know, the model is so minimalistic, or the framework here is so minimalistic that uh, you know these questions could only be answered in a larger model, presumably. Where we where we go into the details of all that, right? And here we just we, here we just sort of 
you know, take take elements of this model and and sort of have to take something from that equilibrium in order to to get a result. But that seems reasonable. So suppose the global currency is circulating alongside the national currencies in both countries, right? That may be a future that you envision. If that's the case, if you see that, then it must be the case that the normal interest rates on the bonds are equal, that the liquidity of services in home and foreign are equal, and that the normal exchange rates become risk-adjusted martingales. Now, remember, I told you this uncovered interest parity, the uncovered uh, 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 uncovered uh, interest parity result, right? And so, so if the interest rates are equal, right, then this result, you know, follows right away because this risk, this interest rate adjustment term that was there before, now you know, it's just equal to one. And so maybe that's you know that's that's an immediate consequence of the first bullet point. But the first, but the first bullet point, the second bullet point, maybe a little bit, you know, surprising that indeed you have to have that the normal interest rates are equal. And as another consequence is you don't only have that for the exchange rates, you know, between dollar and yen. You also have that for the exchange rates between global and home or, or, or global and foreign. So you're also getting these risk-adjusted. Um, Martingale pricing results, right? So I was thinking of Amin's talk, right? I mean, what can we say in general? You know, if a currency is adopted, if it's used as a medium of exchange, right? If a cryptocurrency is adopted as a medium of exchange, you always get these uh, kind of Martingale looking results, right? There's notice that there's no return term in here because, again, these these uh, cryptocurrencies would offer liquidity services. So that's, uh, you know, we had, Linda and me had this in a different paper and it's just always worth emphasizing. Okay, so what's the logic here? Well, the logic is that the introduction of global currency creates global competition between national currencies. So you're getting this currency competition at home between home and global, also between foreign and global, and that induces transnational currency competition between home and foreign. So that way they have to have the same liquidity services and ultimately people in essence, don't care which bond they hold, right? And you get this, you get this competition between global and uh, between home bonds and foreign bonds, and that that induces the normal interest rate equalization. And that's like super, you know, the, the proof you have to you have to string together all these, you know, few elements that you have in just the right sequence to get the results. And so it, it takes, uh, you know, you have to be you can't, you can't trip yourself up by having an assumption that's actually on the paper. So that's the tricky part, but that's that's essentially the logic. Okay, are there escape options? What if the home central bank says no? We don't want to play this game. We want to lower our interest rate below that of the foreign country. You know, after all, we're the central bank. We are free to set the interest rate any way we please. That's true. And if they do that, they make the global currency too expensive to be used at home. The liquidity services, you know, become very cheap in that country. And therefore, you wouldn't want to use the global currency at home. And so that will be one way of getting rid of the global currency at home by just having a very low interest rate. But then if the other foreign bank also thinks about this, you might get to race to the bottom and to the zero lower bound, you know, where both central bank tried to get rid of it. And then they're both stuck at the zero lower bound. And now they both have a normal interest rate of zero. And now again, you know, the global currency might as well, you know, uh, be circulating both countries. So that will be a furic victory if that happens, right? I mean, if you, if you try to stick it to the other country, I mean, maybe that could happen, but that's not, you know, that's maybe not be good for global diplomacy, I guess. The other possibility is, well, wait a second, why can't we just raise the interest rate above that of the foreign central bank? Well, in that case, the home currency becomes too expensive as a medium of exchange, and it's rendered obsolete as a medium of exchange. It may still be used as, medium, as, a, as a unit of account, but now only the global currency would be, would be in circulation, and that's a, that surely for central bank you know, should, be, should be thought of as being very unattractive. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm. Uh, so this, this goes into the details. We also have this, you know, result about asset black global currency. We were thinking of Libra. So there's a consortium that, that fixes essentially the price of this global currency. And how do they do this? They are they're accepting assets and they they hold onto these assets until you cash in your global currency again. Now while they're holding on these assets, they earn interest rate it. We assume that this consortium also charges a fee, fee -t for their services. And so that means that, uh, you know, they, that in order for this to be a no Ponzi scheme, that, that the accountants would be happy with this result. The, the, currency, the, the currency price of this global currency would have to 
you know, develop, you know, at, at this at this at this rate, right? One plus it minus phi minus phi t should be the the growth in value on the on the QT. But remember, we had this we had this uh, exchange rate the, the, that the exchange rate should be, you know, should be martingale. So in particular, in the non-risk case, right? It, the QT should be constant if both the home currency and the global currency are in circulation. And so what you see from this equation here right away is this is, is what we have as the next result, which says that only if phi t and i is equal to i t, so that this term that, that I had here, if this term is equal to one, only then both can exist at home. But if the if the phi is smaller than the normal interest rate, then the home currency is crowded out and only global currency is, is, is used at home. So what this really says is, that the that the that the fee structure for this consortium puts an upper bound on the normal interest rate that the central bank can charge, and therefore really um, you know effectively constrain you know monetary policy. So just to put it in words, if the global currency is asset backed as described, then the home central bank cannot raise its interest rate beyond the management fee without abandoning its own currency as a medium of exchange. Might still be used as a you know as a unit of account. The low management fees imply low interest rates if the home currency remains in use, and that means central banks are forced to stick to the narrow range just above the zen, uh, zero lower bound. All right, so with that, let me conclude. The question was, and it's a deja vu slide, but why not, why not just repeat the key lessons here? What are the monetary policy implications of introducing global currencies? The old answer is we would get this impossible trinity with free capital flows. One cannot both have an independent monetary policy and a pact exchange rates. New here is if we introduce a global currency circulating alongside the national currency, and all three currencies are you know used in particularly the global currencies used at home as well as abroad. Then the monetary policy interest rates are equalized and the exchange rates are risk adjusted Martin Gales. So that's a strengthening of this impossible trinity that's in Mandel Fleming. We call this crypto enforced monetary policy and of SIMS. There are these escape options, right? You could try to lower the normal interest rate at home in order to get rid of the global currency as a medium of exchange, but then maybe that invites the other country to do the same. And then all of them just heading, heading towards a zero low bound, you're stuck there. Or you can raise the normal interest rate, but then you give up the national currency as a medium of exchange. So you can so so now additional restrictions arise if the global currency is asset backed, as would be the case in the Libra, right? It sort of gives us this very narrow range for the normal interest rate that central banks can be in if the fee is small. And, and it all means that impossible opportunity becomes even less reconcilable. And it means that uh, you know, these, these global currencies, if they are you know, circulating widely, uh, might have quite an impact on the international monetary system, international uh, central banks. So it's no surprise, right, that central banks, uh, you know, um, might might uh, might start to worry how the future looks like here and, and want to think about it, right? And, and so that's what this paper is meant to say. I should also say, uh, just maybe as a last remark here, this isn't a paper that that says this is a bad thing or a good thing. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a substantial literature monetary economics that argues that the Friedman rule is optimal, that it's a normal interest rate at zero or near zero is, is pretty much as good as you can do. So if these global currencies, if, if, the, if the effect is, is giving national currencies, you know, competition and a run for their money, as you know, as, as, a, as a pun here, right? It might be that what we end up doing is making national monetary policies more efficient. And that could actually be beneficial for the consumers, right? You're taking away the monopoly of the national central banks and uh, monopolies can be bad, right? But monopolies can also be good if they are national monopolies and, and so, so our paper has nothing to say on welfare. Just, I just don't want to go away saying, oh, you know, the, these, these global currencies are dangerous. I mean, you could read it either way. They, can, they might also be very positive. Yeah. Thanks. So that's about it. <laughs>